My guest today is Brian Gorman. Brian, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you, David? Doing great. What do you do for a living? Uh, talk on shows like this. No, um, I do Azure technical training as my main thing. Uh, I also do uh, boot camp training for introduction to programming, .NET, orientated languages, things like that. So Excellent. Maybe yeah. we'll learn something from you today. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> you also do a lot of public speaking. In fact, I met you at the Nebraska... Uh, was it Nebraska.code is the name of it. And yeah. you did a talk there on um, asynchronous queuing technologies in Azure, right? I, I forgot the exact title of it. Yeah, it's basically that. It's uh, We call that serverless messaging demystified. But basically the point was trying to get people to the point of, hey, these are the main you know, technologies you can use when you have to decouple your workloads between either events or messaging or whatever you're trying to do, and then examining the different things you can do with that at Azure and which one to use in specific scenarios, as well as some of the, you know, the technical limits and stuff. I do a lot of AZ-204 training, so I have a lot of these numbers like in my head and I just spew them, <laughs> which is really dry, but um, good to know if you're going to sit for the AZ-204, or 204, excuse me. Ah, that's a, that's an exam. It sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, this is uh, this is really useful information, even if you're not passing the exam, because I've noticed there's a lot of these queuing technologies in Azure, and it's confusing. It's confusing to even people that are experienced with it. You know, when which one do I use in which situation? Sure. Can, can you just kind of let's let's start just by going through them. What are the available services in Azure? Sure. Yeah, so there's all kinds of things you can do, and it really depends on your workloads or what you're looking at. But the main technologies I covered in this talk and kind of you need to be aware of are the Azure Event Hub, the Azure Event Grid, the Service Bus, and then also the Storage Queue. So um, four different technologies that we went over in this one. Um, you know, and that's not to say this is going to be all encompassing for the different technologies you could use and different th things that you could bake up on your own. But these are the main ones that you would probably employ in 99% of the work that you would want to accomplish either as an event response or as a um, big data pipeline or as uh, you know, for streaming data or as, um, you know, decoupling with a queue or a pub sub type of scenario. Yeah, the, you know, you bring up a good point here. The, uh, the whole idea behind queuing and hubs and things like that is to make mm -hmm. things asynchronous. Well, why do we even do that? Why is that important? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, you accomplish a couple of different things with that, but the main thing that you gain by creating the asynchronous work is that you're going to give yourself the ability to decouple your front end from your back end. So you can call that temporal decoupling, workload decoupling, whatever you want to call that. But basically what we're saying is I can let my users give me data as fast as they want to. And regardless of my back end, I'm not going to get bogged down. So in the past, if you've been in programming for a long time, you know, I you have. might have, yeah, <laughs> you might have run into a scenario where you had to limit throughput uh, from your front end because the back end database couldn't keep up or you just couldn't yeah. process it. Or even worse, you had a, a page that just stopped responding, right? Because your database became so bogged down with a workload. So by doing this, you're talking about either using Azure Function or uh, API management or even you know an app service or you know, containers, whatever your flavor of choice is for your front end, you could basically handle the workload at will for your UI and decouple that by putting it into a queue or you know into a, a hub if you're doing big data, whatever you're doing, either way, you're going to temporarily decouple that workload from the front end to the back end. Now your database can scale as it needs to or keep as small as it needs to. If you don't have a need for immediate processing, maybe you just let that thing run uh, in a slower workload overnight or something, and by the next day you're caught up again. Who cares if that's not important, right? Right. So the idea is that if 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 requests come in from the front end too fast for your back end to handle, you've got some holding area, some staging area that can hang on to those requests and wait for them until the back end's ready to process them. And then that makes it more scalable. Uh, maybe, uh, I guess scalability is the biggest thing. I was going to say more responsive, but that's not necessarily true, depending on how you, respond, how you define it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I would say both, honestly, like you're saying. It, it does make it more responsive for the user because the UI... Oh, you, can, get, you get a response back quickly. It might not be the full response. Or, yeah, and, but point. the UI never gets bogged down, too. So like my right. user is always getting some sort of feedback. Like yeah. I know that it's it's taken the record or not, and then it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to see the data right away. But Sure. Yeah. 
All right. All right. Well, let's let's talk about some of the things you listed four technologies here. Event sure. Hub, Event Grid, Service Bus, and Storage Queue. Can you just quickly define those? Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, basically, the the thing that tripped me up when I first started learning Azure more than anything was the Event Hub and the Event Grid. It was like, what are these for, and why do we have two, and do they go together? Do I need an Event Hub to have an Event Grid? Do I need a grid inside my hub? What's this all about? And the first thing I'll say is no. <laughs> you, they're separate. They're separate projects and separate things. So um, let's let's you know get that out of the way first of all. Now, just saying that I can integrate them together in a solution. So I can have an Event Hub that sends data that the Event Grid responds to, or vice versa, an Event Grid sends data into an Event Hub, or however I want to do that. That I can do, but you don't have to have them. So the Event Hub is the main ingestion space within Azure for big data. So if you're thinking streaming telemetry, you're thinking Event Hub, or basically lots and lots of records. I think the Event Hub handles millions of records per minute, and you can do a lot of different things with it. The Event Hub has a, a partitioning system built into it. You can use a partition key as you write your data to help keep your data separate, separated so you can have different readers doing things at an efficient way. Um, and so ultimately, there's a lot of different configuration that goes into that with, um, this is going to be a little bit technical, but the you know within the Event Hub, you can have up to 32 partitions. Um, you typically would need it around four or so, depending on the, uh, for like a typical workload and an IoT workload. Um, going up to 32 for a really big solution. But ultimately, then you have consumer groups reading those. What that means is you have time series, you can do things where you can replay events within the event hub. And each consumer group has its own individual read on that. So that way I can have multiple applications that don't have to worry about interacting. You know, uh, Application one moved the pointer back seven days ago. Well, application two is still where it was, so it's fine. Um, the thing you've got to keep in mind then is that does open the door for duplicate reads. But I know that's a lot of information really fast, but ultimately the idea here is bringing in millions of records as fast as possible, processing them. You can put other pieces of the puzzle behind that, like a stream analytics job or Synapse analytics behind that with Data Factory to do some ETL or, or, or um, ELT, depending on your, your flavor there as well. Um, so that gives you the, the ability to do all that. You can also port your data from Event Hub into cold storage for your cold storage Lambda path um, in a big data lake, um, in the data lake storage. So the event grid is, uh, it says, you know, event just like you would think. If you're thinking, I pressed a button on a web page, that's an event. I respond to something. If, if anything happens, it can generate an event. And so what the cool thing is within Azure, we have Azure Monitor. Azure Monitor allows us to see everything that happens within our Azure subscription. It could be someone logged in, someone stopped a VM, someone started a VM, um, you know, whatever it might be. Those events are all logged by Azure Monitor. And every single thing that you do there, you can use Event Grid to respond to. So Event Grid is, is you know, one-off events are happening. And you can tell Event Grid to listen for these events, and then you can have multiple subscribers responding to them. And you can even filter them by things like topic or subject as well. So that way, specific people will respond to the right thing. Hmm. So those are the two big event ones. So Event Hub, again, streaming. Um, I forgot to mention IoT Hub is a subset of the Event Hub. So if you're in the IoT space, it's similar to the Event Hub. It uses the same SDK for programming. And ultimately, it's just a little bit more lightweight. It has a couple of unique features that you need when you're working with, with IoT devices. So mm -hmm. that's your big data, your streaming. Event Grid is your one-off events. And you can write custom events. Um, typically, most of us that program have said that you know, writing custom events is fine, but a lot of times you might be getting confused that you should have actually used a message. And so remember that an event is only going to send data about the event itself. So you have JSON that's automatic and it's going to have some schema information for every single event and then it has a data. And that data contains a payload, things like, the, let's say I'm uh, responding to a blob storage upload event. In that data will be the URL of the blob that was uploaded. Okay. But that's all there is. So if I want to do that, that's fine, and respond to that, that's awesome, because then I can do things like process that file. I don't need to know anything else. If I get a file name and I know that my job is to process it, I don't need other you know, information about it. But a message is I need somebody to actually like interpret this and do something, or it's more, pay it's more than just payload. It's, it's directional. It's, it's, it's got 
uh, information involved with it, like um, perhaps you know uh, a binary blob object in it itself that's been okay. serialized um, inside that message that you can respond to. So you can transmit objects between systems. So just like if you were to transmit something over the web, you can serialize some JSON, throw it into a service bus, and now you can have, if you do a service bus queue, you can have ordered response that's guaranteed order, um, just like a FIFO queue, first in, first out. So that's the service bus queue. Now the service bus topics are a really interesting thing because the service bus topics are basically pub sub queues, meaning that I can do pub sub from one queue to multiple subscribers. Okay. So um, in the sample code that's in the repo, um, I don't know, I'm assuming you'll post that. If you want to take a look at it later on your own, the or if not, um, it's just out on my GitHub at BL Gorman under serverless messaging demystified. But ultimately, the um, the way that I show this in the talk and through the sample code is we have a, a list of movies. So imagine you're you know a video store, even though they're all defunct now, but your blockbuster, or, uh, sorry, superbuster, you know something like that, and you have you have a video store and you have twenty movies and or seventeen movies or whatever I put in that queue, um, and they're all listed. And I, I load those movies one time into the queue. Mm -hmm. And then we do a pub sub where we have a specific subscriber filtered to only show adult movies, like rated R movies. We're talking okay. here, like, you know, um, you know, the movies that most of us as adults are interested in. And family movies, like, you know, um, Toy Story or something. Um, and then all the movies. Some of us adults are interested in those. <laughs> Right, exactly. Uh, I have young kids, so to Toy Story is a very interesting movie right now. Um, but anyway, we have also the um, the all movies. So we have three different pub sub queues, essentially. And then I can process them individually, even though I only loaded the data one time. And all the all movies will show all my data. The, you know, the other ones show the rest of them. So we're talking about sending a list of movies across the wire via message again decoupling here um, where i can basically just read that list so the advantage of that is that uh, you can subscribe to it to all movies or just r-rated movies or just uh g-rated movies uh, right it's up to the client to, to choose what they want right and yeah I, I mean obviously like there's other ways you could do this better in real code but just to to demonstrate the concept being right. You know, here's here's how we can do the same data set and and segregate it three different ways for different different subscribers with messages. Yeah. yeah. So um, so that's service bus, and then ultimately storage queue. So storage queue is a lightweight queuing system, just like service bus. The caveat to storage queue is that you can't guarantee order. Um, it is typically ordered, but it it can't be guaranteed. And there's so. Um, deeper into the weeds here a little bit as a developer, if you're working with service bus, you're going to have two options when you read from the queue. You can do a peak where you basically get the data, but you don't clear, clear it out. Or mm -hmm. you can do, um, I can't remember the technical term or what, what the code exact code is, but the, it's, it's like read and, and, and delete or something, retrieve or something like that. Right. Um, where basically you're doing the peak and removing from the queue at the same time. Okay. So. If you if you use the peak, you can process your data and then call to remove later within Service Bus. Or if you use the other one, you're gonna you're basically gonna get it and it's gonna be gone out of the queue immediately. Mm -hmm. um, storage queue doesn't have the get and gone immediately. It just has the read, and it also has this little bit of a thing behind the scenes where it's it's like it'll time out after 60 seconds if you don't renew your lease on that data and it goes back into the queue if you don't do mm -hmm. that. So you just gotta it's, just it's transactional. Yeah, so you got to make sure as as you're developing that if you know something's going to take more than 60 seconds or whatever, that you send that command to renew your lease so nobody else grabs that item out of the queue. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so big data eventing uh, in the event hub. And then, uh, sorry, big data goes in the event hub. Event grid is for one-off events. Service bus, topics, and queues are for messaging between disparate systems. And storage queue is also for messaging. Um, storage queue has... An automatic purge after seven days and it can store way more data but the message size is smaller so oh, those are, that, those is, are that is a lot of information here yeah i think what's uh um, of interest to most people is uh how do you distinguish between when to use what so for example storage queues and service bus queues they sound really similar in fact you said they're mm -hmm. this one is lightweight just like that one uh i know one guarantees order the other doesn't right but what what's as I'm building an application, what's what are the considerations I need to take into account? Yeah, so um, 
You know, that's a really great question because it, it, it does depend on what you're trying to accomplish. Storage queue is going to be probably less expensive to just kind of go that route. Um, but you're going to be able to store millions of records of data. So over 80 gigabytes of data. So if you have massive amounts of messages that you need to process, you might be looking at storage queue just for that reason, especially if they're volatile, meaning that, you know, you're going to process them quickly and they're who cares after that. Um, mm. Because again, the storage queue does have that automatic purge at seven days. I think you can up that, but um, just keep that in mind. Uh, you might have a shorter life cycle service, service buses and service, um, service bus queue and topics, those are going to not have an automatic purge. So like the, the, the data is indefinite there. Um, mm. I think you can put a, uh, sorry, you can put a time to live on those though. So like if I want it to delete after 14 days, I think it, you can set that in the account. So. Got it. But by default, there yeah. that, isn't there? Yeah. So I guess my, my, my first would be cost considerations. I would, you know, if I, if I can do this lightweight, if I have small message sizes and I, ha or, or, or I have lots and lots and lots of data that I want to message, then I'd be looking at storage queue. Um, storage queue might have a little bit of lower entry barrier, just getting it set up. Um, also, it's pretty easy to work with the storage SDK against code. Um, so getting a storage account with a storage queue and just working with it, jumping through a couple of hoops to connect to your account and then making sure you're just renewing your leases or purging when you're done. Uh -huh. Um, uh, which is nothing that a developer can't handle easily. Um, service bus and service queue has a little bit more of a setup. You, you set up a, a namespace. So it's really interesting because the event hub and the service bus all live in the service bus namespace. Um, so even the uh, Azure's really, really, really good at URL naming when it comes to some of these things. So like if I look at a blob storage account, I can tell it's a blob storage by the URL because it literally says blob in it. Table says yeah. table. You know, um, Q says Q. So the where it gets even more confusing for people in eventing is that the event hub actually has a service bus namespace. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's the one like area where it's like a little bit gray. So, but both of them have what's called a namespace. So you set up a namespace and then within that namespace, you create your topics or your queues or your hubs. And they're um, they're independent of each other, so so don't con um, don't let me confuse you here with you know I set up one namespace I can have service buses and event hubs in it. No, um, I need an event hub namespace. I need a service bus namespace. They both just have a service bus URL, but they are independent of each other. Hmm, is that interesting? Sorry, yeah. No, no, no it is confusing. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, that, that's one thing. The storage, Azure storage, you're right. They did a uh, good job of naming that. But in general, I've always thought Microsoft, which does a lot of good things, is naming things is not one of their strengths. <laughs> well, you got a big corp. You got a lot of people doing a lot of different things with a lot of ideas. So it's I'm hard. not pointing fingers. I'm just making yeah. observations. I'm, I, yeah. I, I actually work for Microsoft. So yeah. <laughs> a little bit of self analysis there. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, um, one other thing. Uh, so I was given this talk actually at a different conference than the one we met at, which was uh, DevUp in St. Louis. Oh, I've been there. It's a great conference. Yeah, I was. A, it was on a fun and what a great uh, what a great venue, by the way. Um, anyway, I, I digress. Uh, and I was given this talk, and, and a question was asked uh, around, you know, which which one of these should I choose when? And actually, one of the attendees, his name was Barry. Um, he he responded with what was probably the most uh, concise and correct answer I've heard which was, do I need someone to respond to it or not, basically? So mm -hmm. if it's, and basically by that, like, uh, not, sorry, not just to respond to it. Um, I'm, and I'm not doing it justice, what he said. Um, need someone to, um, to acknowledge so it. Or, yeah, and basically, so I can consume an event, but Event Hub or Event Grid doesn't care whether or not it was consumed, okay. right? So if I fire an event, I say, hey, hey guys, hey subscribers, this happened. Okay. Go do something. And then I leave. I don't care. Service bus, I say, hey, I've got messages. And then I say, hey, did anybody respond to this message? Um, hey, I've got some messages that never got delivered. Those are important to, things to know, right? So if you if you need to have, you know, guarantees that things are getting processed, um, I'm looking at service bus for that reason. Um, they have dead letter queues so that you can see things that were never responded to or were delivered. Um, you can see, you know, which messages have been processed and, and honestly in the Azure portal now, they've got a really cool view. I think it's still in preview, um, where ultimately you can, you can view the messages in your queue now and just go out there and look mm -hmm. and see what's out there. And you can, you know, hit tabs to see which one is, uh, what you can look at your dead letter queue. You can look at your normal queue and you can see the messages and the number of messages that are out there, 
um, all of the metrics you get with every service at Azure, all that stuff that you can respond to as well. So, oh, excellent. Was that Barry Stahl by chance? I believe so. Okay, I he think was on my show it. earlier this year. <laughs> uh, I, I believe it was him. Um, that's the name that was coming to my mind, but I didn't want to misquote <laughs> the, the last name. So, uh, uh, yeah, he was. Uh, he does a talk on reliable systems, which involves queuing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, it was probably him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope he's watching. <laughs> I hope so too. Uh, is there anything? This is a lot, a lot of information. I know that we could dive a lot deeper, but do you think this is there anything that's uh, that's critical that uh, people that are just starting to understand this need to know? Yeah, that's yeah, that's great. Um, let me think about that for one minute, because ultimately, if I was just getting started, the confusion of which one to use when is probably the biggest the biggest thing, and mm -hmm. understanding what my workload is and what it needs. Um, I would say, you know, if you're just looking at responding to events, the one thing I would say, the first thing I would say around the event grid is if you can, don't start out writing custom events. It's just a little tricky and they're not necessarily super easy to work with. Um, once you get it, it's not terrible, but, um, I, I would say if you're trying to do something where you're writing something custom, either use storage queue or service bus. Those, those would be my first choices. Yes, you can create custom events. Yes, you can fire a custom event from your web page or whatever. And yes, that works. And there's even you know samples out there in, in Microsoft Docs to see how you could do that and, and, and do it. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest things that people do. It's like, instead of using a message queue or a queue, you know, instead of using service bus or, or storage queue, they start by saying, well, I should just write a custom event. And I'm not sure that that's what you're looking for. Because again, that's just a, a data piece that says something happened. It doesn't really have context of what happened. Like this right. is the mess, the message that goes with it. So, okay. Uh, where's a good place online to get started learning about this? Oh yeah. So, um, the, the places you can go to learn about serverless messaging, um, well, obviously Microsoft docs is the first place I would go. I would go out there. They have tutorials on every single one of the technologies. So you can go to, you know, just search for storage queued and then go site docs, microsoft.com. And you'll see, you know, all, all the information about it. They have tutorials and samples usually on every doc. Um, Microsoft Learn, the ecosystem there around the AZ-204 exam. There's an entire unit on messaging. Um, and so there's uh, a number of prefabbed um, modules that you could look through there as well. Um, and then obviously your normal channels, um, whatever your other choices would be after that. But um, you know, I'm sure there's videos on you know all the favorite places, LinkedIn Learning, Pluralsight, all that stuff as well. But yeah, there's going to be one on this channel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and then also your uh, I, I want to call it a blog post, but it's actually on your GitHub page. You've got a readme there, which is uh, at uh, GitHub.com/slash/blgorman, uh, and then the page happens to be serverless messaging demystified, but that's hard to say. So I'll put that link in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got to make your titles fancy so people you will go. pick you, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, All right. No, but um, uh, where, are you speaking again soon? So actually, I'm not. I'm kind of bummed because I had to basically not submit to some of my favorite conferences like CodeMash this year. Um, and the reason is because I am going to take on a contract uh, starting in October and it goes through February. And this is a really cool program, though. This is actually my favorite thing to do. It's through Microsoft. I'm subcontracting from um, from some channels, but ultimately, it's Microsoft Software and Systems Academy. And what this is, it's uh, it's an 18 week or 17 week boot camp, but it's specifically for military veterans who are transitioning out of the military or already have. So last last cohort I ran. Um, I had one student that had been on the military for a number of years, like 15 years. So it's a, it's a, it's a rigorous process to apply, but if you're interested, um, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, um, and I can get you the page that the Microsoft page, or, you know, maybe we could look it up later, David, but, um, it has, uh, there's a process that you need to go through, but it's really cool. It's 17 weeks. It is uh, 16 weeks of basic from the ground up coding into all the way through the AZ-204. So cloud application developer. Now, if you're listening to this for some reason, you actually prefer networking, there's another path for systems admin as well. 
So if you like networking, there there was at one point a cybersecurity path. I'm not sure where that's at right now, mm-hmm. um, but I think the the networking one would be probably the other the other path. So right now those two for sure. Um, you apply, you get in. So and I'll be doing that, but that that's a full time deal from February through or through October through February. So I I couldn't get away to, to do conferences. So right now I have um, just things like this user groups um, on my on my thing, but I don't I don't think I have anything else particularly planned that I can think of off the top of my head right now. So. Oh, it sounds like a great way to spend your time. Maybe after February, when you're through this, we could talk about that on the yeah, show. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and yeah, um, definitely tell people how it is. And uh, I know that uh, every student that I had, so this, the really cool thing is um, they get a guaranteed interview with Microsoft. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to go anywhere, but at least right. they get to interview, right? Mm-hmm. And um, there's also, a, it's it's not just coding and it's not just, um, you know, cloud application development or, or systems admin. There's a professional development program that they get to do through that as well, where people from Microsoft work with them to um, learn how to interview and learn oh, how yeah. to, um, you Can know, write resume resumes. Yeah. And so um, they get to do all that. And so I get to right. be a part of that and it's super fulfilling to me. And, and uh, so... Unfortunately, though, that means I have to miss code mash, and and that bums me out a lot. Um, but not that I would have got selected, but if I had, you know, I've been there a couple of times, and it's a super fun conference. And I've, I know been, that, I've been to all of them. Uh, Brian yeah. Pence runs that. Is a, he's an old friend and a yeah. great human being, and runs a great conference. Yeah, yeah. So all right. Well, thank you so much for your time, and yeah. stay safe. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. Thanks for having me. So one last thing, um, you remember that TV show Friends? Yeah. Um, can you imagine what would happen if they had today's technology in that show? There would be six people sitting in a room with a phone. Look at this meme. 